Gosh, it was great to see Sakes tonight. Let's go to Matt Weiner in Atlanta. Echo that, Kevin. Great to see Sags at the game in Houston. We've got Inside the NBA presented by Kia coming up next here from Atlanta. Chris Bosch is in the house tonight on loan to us from the Miami Heat. Of course, Isaiah Thomas, Grant Hill. I'm Matt Weiner. Highlights from both games tonight. We'll look ahead to the other series on their off days uh, and usual hijinks. As well. <laughs> it's all coming up here from Studio J. We'll see you in a minute. Hey there again, everybody. It's Inside the NBA, presented by Kia. Great to see you out there here in Atlanta. I'm Matt Weiner, in for Ernie Johnson tonight. Isaiah Thomas, the Hall of Famer, seven-time NBA All-Star, <laughs> two-time <laughs> national champion, Grant Hill, and uh, two-time world champion and ten-time NBA All-Star, Chris Bosh, who's uh, with us from the Miami Heat. Welcome. Thank you. Great to have you with us all night. A reminder, EJ and the fellows return. They're in New York, by the way, hanging out corporate thing you would what's well, not worth explaining it's tv stuff okay. anyway they're back tomorrow night for another doubleheader the hawks and wizards return here to atlanta for their game five likewise the west's top seed is also tied up through four games the dubs and the grizzlies tip in oakland for their game five tomorrow night just saw the clippers in houston in their game five what that a sight for sore eyes or what craig sager hanging out in houston Meeting the fans, him back out there. talking over with Chris Paul. Even the sweaters are bright with Craig. Rockets went right to the paint. James Harden to Dwight Howard. Then it's Clint Capella. Ooh. Kind of an ah Capella moment, if you will. Everybody was playing well for the Rockets tonight. Who knew? Man. He did. <laughs> but it's plays like that that really spark a, a home crowd. And, you know, the Clippers, they just could never really bounce back, really, from, from uh, the first quarter on. Chris Paul, the little hesitation move there. That got the Clippers within four. Josh Smith got the start tonight. Blacks, great, uh, Blake Griffin. Celebration. Spencer Hawes knocks down the three. Getting playing time in the second quarter because DeAndre Jordan had picked up his third foul. Here's the beard going to work. Mm. A little Mad defense right there. <laughs> then the step back through the legs. 15-2 Houston run to end the half. And they were up by 15 at the break. Third quarter. Smith out to Trevor Ariza. Locked and loaded for three. And I thought Ariza shot the ball really well tonight. He got his jump shot back on, 8 for 12 from the field, 4 for 6 from the three-point line. And, and Howard around the rim was his dominating self. Ariza had 22. Howard had another double-double. In fact, he surpassed his total point and rebound production from Game 4 in the first quarter of Game 5. And tonight, you really got to give it to James Harden. I mean, he had a big night, obviously, uh, with the triple-double. But just starting the game and finishing the game aggressive. He was setting his teammates up, rebounding the basketball, and just making plays all night. They couldn't stop him. Finds Capella there. Jordan had more foul trouble on the bench. Nothing he can do over there. Josh Smith for the open three as a team. The Rockets took 29, knocked down nine of them. Terry misses. Harden gets his 10th board. That gets the triple-double done. And then Harden Ooh. will get it back and just for good measure knock down the three. But late in the game, with about a minute 45 to go, we saw Harden walk off. Kevin Harlan was describing his labored breathing, and we heard from Tracy Wolfson that he's been battling a little bit of a cold. You wouldn't know it from his performance on the floor. His first career postseason triple double with 26, 11. And 10 assists, double double for Dwight Howard. Let's listen in to Kevin McHale. Just discuss his impact on this game. Played great. I mean, he had eight defensive rebounds, got out and ran. Four for six, four from six from the three point line. I thought Trevor did a great job. Guarded um, Riddick um, and just did a did a tremendous job today. I mean, you know, just was a had a big game for us. We needed it. I thought he and Dwight really got us going. James was feeling a little bit under the weather. And, um, then James really started warming into the game. He was moving the ball, two on the ball, and you know we attacked. We finally, you know, we, we, we got to the basket. And we got our points in the paint and tried to attack and played a little bit more like we tried to play throughout the entire year. That was really the first kind of game offensively that we kind of played downhill and 
um, got our rhythm going. When they made some of the runs that I'm sure you expected, was the resolve different, or how would you describe the resolve compared to what we had seen? I thought we just had more juice. I thought that you know we were rebounding well. Um, I thought the ball was moving. I thought they put two on. They put James on the ball. Two on the ball with James. He got off it. I thought Josh made some nice passes out of things. And um, you know Dwight was huge on the boards. He was huge on the offensive glass. And um, you know that's you know that's how we have to play. We have to you know we have uh, got the next game in L.A. And you know once they won game one here, we're gonna have to win a game there at some point. And uh, um, might as well be might as well be the next one. It's our only chance we're gonna have at it. So you know I mean we we did what we wanted to do. We wanted to win tonight and get back to L.A. Defensively, is that what you've been looking for pretty much this entire series? Yeah, I was looking for just to have for us to have juice and play downhill and attack them, and and just and not, you know, uh, you know, we play better when we play inside out attack downhill. We're one of the top teams in the league at getting points in the paint, and we weren't, we just weren't doing it. Now, you know, um, again, I thought we attacked sometimes tonight, and you know, the whistle gets a little bit different, but we just got to keep attacking, and we got we got to put a lot of pressure on the referees. To, you know, there's a lot of contact at the basket, and when we play with Dwight and you play with James, there's going to be a lot, and we just got to keep putting that on, um, putting that pressure on them, and you know, trying to get, uh, trying to get downhill, trying to get in the paint, and then we kick it out. Kevin Jane, another blowout in a series full of blowouts, and you heard Kevin McHale talk about the defense being a little better. It couldn't be much worse than it has been in the four games prior. They were giving up nearly 120 a game on 50% shooting, just 42% shooting in this one. So five games in now, it's 3-2, but the average margin of victory here is more than 20 points per. This is the first time, in fact, since the 1995 conference semis between Phoenix and Houston that there have been three straight games decided by 20 points or more. I don't know what you make of that, but what can the Rockets take from this game that they can apply to L.A. on Thursday night? Well, I mean, I think they can take a lot. I mean, just the way, like Coach McHale said, they're attacking uh, the paint, Harden having a huge game, Dwight getting off to a very good start and kind of setting the tone for his team and really just um, playing good defense. I mean, they held uh, the Clippers to 41.8%. They shot 91 shots. And, you know, usually when you shoot so many shots, you're giving up a lot more points, but you have to give credit to uh, the Houston defense uh, for really stepping up and responding to their coach. And, you know, sometimes it, it, it's like that. You're going to be down 3-1. You didn't ask to be put there, but it's all about how you respond. And now the Clippers have to be careful because not only did they give up 124 points, Trevor Ariza got going tonight. Right. You, uh, you see Dwight got going. James, he played like... He was an MVP candidate tonight, which he has been, but he really put his mark on today's game. And, you know, it, the pressure's on the Clippers now going back home. And if they don't win that game, anything can happen in game seven. Kevin McHale talked about the points in the paint. Um, Rockets spent more time in the paint than Benjamin Moore in this game. They had, <laughs> they had 64 of them. What does that say to you? Well, it says that they were aggressive. They weren't settling for uh, jump shots. Uh, they had good ball movement. And as he said, they played inside out. Uh, they kept attacking the basket. They got Howard established down low. Harden started driving the basketball. And what I saw happening in the game was most importantly, they all got confidence. And I think this is the first time that the Rockets have played this well in the series. They had a great season, uh, but this is the first time I think they've played this well in the series. And the Clippers are in a very dangerous position because when you have a team down, you, you got to put them away. And they didn't put them away tonight. Not only did they not put them away, but they let them score 124 points, and everybody got confident. Now everybody feels good again, and the pressure's on the Clippers now to close out in L.A. Grant, how much different is it for the Rockets that they did it inside out? They didn't shoot particularly well from three-point range, which is a big part of their attack. How much different is it that they did it physically and they did it where they wanted to do it, near the rim? Well, well two things. I'll get back to what Isaiah said at halftime. Uh, they got away from all the gimmicks. I think that was important. It wasn't working. All the hacker, whoever, it, it wasn't working. They weren't having success with that. So they got back to playing uh, basketball the right way. And I think there was a concerted effort to attack. And they shoot a lot of three-pointers, I think, early on in the game. 
Um, you know, the Clippers shot, actually for the game, the Clippers shot more threes than the Rockets, but it was attack. You talk about getting calls and getting to the free throw line. When you attack and you're aggressive, a lot of times uh, you give yourself a, an opportunity to get to the free throw line. But more importantly, their officials see that. They see that the team, and they usually favor the team that is being mm -hmm. more aggressive. Mm -hmm. But that aggressiveness got DeAndre Jordan in foul trouble mm -hmm. and really got the confidence going. Okay, you know what? We can have success getting into the paint in the first half, having success getting high percentage shots. And I just think from there, everything started flowing. Ariza was hitting shots. Terry, they just got into a nice rhythm. They got comfortable, yep. as Isaiah said, yep. and confident. And that is a dangerous thing as they go back to, to L.A. For, for game six. And then it helped them on defense, too. Yeah. You know, they, they, this is a team where they have great defenders, but they had lost their confidence on the offensive side of the ball. So they stopped defending as well as we know they all can defend. Uh, yeah. And consequently, they start making shots. And once they start making shots, I think their defense picked up. And they got a little bit more moxie about themselves and started challenging. Well, I mean, when you're playing against a set defense every time, if you're the Clippers, that's not what you want to see, especially in the playoffs. And, and also, I just want to bring up a point. Corey Brewer, Terrence Jones, uh, well, Corey with 15 points, uh, uh, Terrence Jones with 12 points, both on five of eight shooting. Big production off the bench for the Rockets. They moved it around a little bit, too. 29 assists tonight. That is a postseason season high for them compared to just 11 turnovers along the way. But the Clippers can still close it out Thursday night, Game 6 in L.A. We've got highlights ahead from Game 5 of the Bulls Cavaliers series, including uh, plenty of the King. Chris, Chris may feel wistful. <laughs> Did you call him the King, Chris? No. <laughs> LeBron works. <laughs> For a unique take on the NBA playoffs and the entire season for that matter, check out the starters weeknights on NBA TV. Plenty of fun along the way uh, throughout the postseason and really the they, entirety of the year. Do they pick out their own wardrobes? Yes. They, Isn't there a dress code around right here? Yes, they do. Not for them, apparently. Okay. Hey, the, uh, <laughs> the Houston Rockets get a convincing 21-point win tonight over the L.A. Clippers to force a game six in L.A. on Thursday night. But... Some concern along the way for Houston. James Harden, after his first career postseason triple-double, walked off late in the game with uh, some labored breathing. And Tracy Wolfson's been covering that and has more for us on the beard. That is true. I actually watched him throughout the game. He was coughing on the bench, but it obviously didn't seem to affect him on the court. He did look a little drained, but we just heard from Kevin McHale, and he said that he's been battling uh, sickness all day long. I was just in the locker room, and I was told as soon as he came back there before the game ended, he received some fluids. He went right into the shower. He's out now, and he's going to be addressing the podium shortly so we can ask all the questions we want, but still a terrific performance performance for a guy who was dealing with an illness. Absolutely. Seemed uh, plenty healthy to the Clippers, I'm sure. Tracy, we appreciate it. Tracy Wolfson with us from Houston tonight. Well, it's been a playoff season full of buzzer beaters, but as far back as we can track, 740 series all time, the Bulls Cavaliers East semifinal is the first time there have been decisive shots at the horn of consecutive games. Each, by the way, by former MVPs, Derrick Rose in Game 3, LeBron James in Game 4. It's enough to make a person want to call a timeout, if he has one, and appreciate the drama. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Nearly as dramatic, the pregame injury reports tonight with injured all-stars in varying states of fitness ahead of Game 5. Pau Gasol sat out for the second straight game with his injured hamstring, so no pow for the Bulls in Cleveland. For the Cavs, LeBron was back after near continuous treatment on his sprained ankle and Kyrie Irving told Rachel Nichols he thought he'd be as much of a decoy as anything else for game five. Here's Derrick Rose. No decoy there. He had five of his first seven shots, had 12 in the first quarter. Story of the night, though, the king. You really don't call him the king. No. LeBron James locked in from the start. And what does mama call him? Baby. <laughs> Baby. I don't know about you guys. I didn't think Urban really looked like a decoy here. Uh, he had a fantastic game tonight. He responded well. Well, the decoy was in his statement that I'll be a decoy. That might have been the decoy. <laughs> sure. That's, that was the deception, at least. Rose still attacking, finishing there. Chicago up by five. Cleveland backcourt pretty good all night. Iman Shumpert 
to Irving. And they were knocking down shots. He had 25 more than Decoy. his previous two games combined in this series. Second quarter, LeBron scores the Cavaliers' first 12. Nice. He got it going down there on that, that block. Once he gets it going down on the block, it's not much you can do. He's going to start handling the ball as the game goes on. But when he's aggressive, taking it to the hole, getting down in the paint, getting turnaround jump shots and layups, getting to the free throw line, they're going to be tough to beat. He had 16 in the second quarter, 24 by halftime. Cleveland led it by 10 as they hit the locker room. Rose, a swipe here, finds Jimmy Butler, his running mate for the layup. The Bulls still down just four. And then it's Nikola Mirotic to Butler. Locked and loaded for three. Cleveland's lead down to one. Cleveland just hanging around. Keep it close. J.R. Smith past Dunleavy. Mm -hmm. That's a tough shot. Cavs by six. James and one. Made the free throw. Cleveland up by nine. Cavs had all the momentum as the third quarter closed, or so it seemed. Check this out. Closing seconds of the third. It's Miritic from what they're calling 48 feet. Mm. Swish. And what was really interesting about that shot, it seems like Cleveland was on their way to kind of blowing the game open. That actually kept Chicago in. It gave them a chance to kind of respond and then really deflate the crowd. Took a lot of breath out of them. You love how the emotions come into play in these games. Who can handle it? Who can? Ooh. Who gets into it? Who doesn't? Aaron Brooks bucket here. Taj Gibson and Matthew Del Vadover tangled up. Gibson's called for a flagrant two after trying to free his leg. Watch Del Vadova. First of all, he must have eyes in the back of his head to know exactly when to clamp onto Gibson's leg. And Gibson responds by a little kick there. That got him thrown out. You think that's the first time he's done that? Yeah, but I, I thought when they went in and they and they looked at the video, they, they should have saw that, you know, he had him in a leg lock, and I thought both of them should have been. And Aaron Brooks came in and shoved somebody, and he escaped without any punishment either, all under the watchful eyes of Adam Silver. Yeah, but the leg lock definitely, I mean, you know, like, tit for tat, both of them should have got The wrestling move right there. <laughs> Cavs eventually put together an 18-5 to run. They had a 17-point lead. James with his only three of the night, and he passes Jason Kidd for ninth in the all-time postseason made threes list. He had 38, but the Bulls answer with their own 18-5 to run. Butler to Joe Kim Noah. You know, anytime you get buckets out of Noah, you, you know you're doing well because he's out there strictly to defend and rebound. Butler with three of his 29 on the night. Chicago showed a lot of grit and heart. It's continuing to chip away at that lead. Absolutely. Pass and this was break. just an incredible play right here. One of the plays of the night. I think it was a play of the night. They had a chance to tie the game. LeBron, man, that was uh, that's a vintage move right there. He's been doing that for years. You've seen that before up close. Luckily, it wasn't my shot. <laughs> <laughs> James misses here. Ball gets batted around. It pinballs into the hands of Amon Shumpert. Kyrie, Kyrie Irving would knock down a couple of free throws to make it a two-possession game. And then the Bulls just not executing late. Noah throws it away. He had four of the Bulls' 11 turnovers. It was pretty improbable that Chicago was in this game. No Pau Gasol. Derrick Rose was clearly injured, as you'll You'll hear more about in just a moment, and somehow it's a five-point game. Cleveland takes the 3-2 lead. And by the way, I'm obligated to tell you that in game fives, when the two teams were tied at two, the winners of those game fives go on to win the series 82% of the time. I, I know hate everyone hates that, but I, I, hate have, the I have to tell you. Yeah, are you, are you an analytics job. guy? It's, <laughs> that's not really analytics. Okay. That's just, that's just, yeah. that's just numbers. Okay. LeBron's 35th career, 30-10. <laughs> postseason game that's roughly 21 percent of the postseason games he's played he's but played i was asking you to answer my question you're an analytics guy a little, but isn't a little that, isn't that that a, isn't it, that's not really analytics oh, i didn't ask it but that's analytics. basic math but isn't it numbers well, i mean it is numbers yes okay. we're having two different conversations you two talk amongst, <laughs> talk amongst yourselves while rachel nichols goes over the particulars <laughs> from cleveland what did it take for you guys to play this way in this game five we got to give what we got. And uh, whatever it is out on the floor, if we're on the floor, we have to try to produce and help our team win and lead them. And uh, 
you know, it was great that I was able to be. I was 24 hour around the clock since uh, since game four. I mean, you're not kidding. You actually slept uh, getting treatment, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I slept treatment every single day since game four, and uh, you know, through the grace of the man above and, uh, my, and my personal trainer Mike Mancias, he did a great job of helping myself get ready and. Kyrie's been around the clock as well. We just, we're just happy we're able to do some things to help our team win. The points you scored tonight or that block on Derrick Rose at the end? What meant the most to you? Um, I would say the rebounds and the, the, the extra possessions. I was very efficient tonight, you know, and, uh, and that's what I want to be for my teammates. Now, while LeBron's performance dominated Game 5, the night was not without controversy. The Bulls' Taj Gibson was ejected in the second half after officials ruled he kicked Matthew Dellavedova. But after the game, Gibson had a very different account. He leg locked me. I was I just pulled my leg back, and it made it look like I kicked him. Up. Not a dirty play at all, but he just leg locked me. I tried to get my foot out of there. He was pretty strong for a little guy. There were some fans who threw some some things at you as you left. What did you feel? Uh, that's what that's what happens when you're in Cleveland. Second time in a row they threw stuff at us, but it's classless. But we have to play. We're here to play basketball. I can't focus on that kind of stuff. Did you think that was excessive to, to go ahead and eject him? And what kind of influence did that play on the game? I, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, it's just bizarre. Yeah, I saw it. Derrick Rose was also of concern in the game's second half. He was seen flexing his hand and wrist several times and received treatment on his shoulder during a timeout. When asked about the injury, Rose simply said, no excuses and noted that while the Bulls are now facing elimination, quote, it's not the end, and we're not quitting. In Cleveland, I'm Rachel Nichols. What a night for LeBron James. 38 points, 12 boards, six assists along the way, three blocks, three steals. Uh, he's now on this list of guys who've put up 35, 10, 5, 3, and 3. Elvin Hayes, Dwayne Wade. Uh, Wade and James did it without turnovers. They weren't tracking turnovers when Elvin did it. And you played, of course, with Dwayne Wade. Excuse me, Wade had five turnovers. James did it without a turnover. We don't know about Elvin. You, of course, played with Dwayne. You played with LeBron. I don't think you played with Elvin. No, I don't think so. No, I, don't think so. <laughs> I didn't think so. Just make I watch sure. tape. So uh, the Bulls are going back home for game six, but it certainly doesn't look great for Chicago right now. Uh, Rose obviously banged up whatever was going on with his hand, wrist, arm, shoulder, et cetera. He missed 15 of his last 17 shots in this game. He missed his final 11 along the way. Can the Bulls win this series if Pau Gasol doesn't come back in soon? Well, I don't think so. I think it'll be very tough. But, you know, looking at Cleveland, they have their own problems. But you want to be as close to 100% as possible. And you definitely want to have a guy who can stretch the floor, who can rebound, protect the rim, and you can dump it down uh, in, in the low post to him. And, you know, Powell is one of their leaders. He's done it a bunch of different times. And, you know, they're missing that. And you definitely need that. But... If I was Chicago, I would just kind of take a step back, look at it, and, you know, despite everything that happened, even with Taj Gibson getting ejected, even with them being banged up, they still had a chance to tie the game. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they had a chance to win. They had a chance to tie the still game. They had late, multiple yeah. chances. And I think if you're looking at going back home to Chicago, you feel that there are so many things that you can correct. And they went to the line 28 times a day. That's something that they have to continue to do is be aggressive, especially at home. What do you make of where we stand now through five games? I, if, if you're Cleveland, um, you know, you, you got to go to Chicago and, and, and win. But I also think Chicago, the way they play tonight, I think they're feeling pretty confident, hmm. you know, because they had a chance to win in Cleveland on the road. Uh, they didn't get blown out. Uh, they right, they're right in it at the end. So now they're, they're getting on the bus or they're getting on the plane. They're going back to Chicago and they're saying, hey, you know, we can win at home. And Cleveland needs to be careful because if, Ch if Cleveland, I mean, if Chicago wins at home and it's a blowout win, then they're coming back to Cleveland in a game seven with all the momentum. So, you know, let, let's, let's take a close look at that, that game in Chicago and, and we'll see what the score is because if, if Chicago plays well and they blow Cleveland out, they're coming back with all the momentum in a game seven back at Cleveland. Grant, what if uh, the LeBron James we saw tonight shows up for game six on oh, Thursday? It, oh, it, it's over. And, you know, I, I really have to <clears throat> commend LeBron. I mean, after game three, that heartbreaking loss where Derrick Rose hit that buzzer beater in the press conference, 
he put it on himself. You know, he deflected all the attention from his teammates, Kyrie Irving, who's been struggling. LeBron said, it's on me. I have to play better. Uh, and he has. He came through in game four with the big shot. And tonight, his aggressiveness. So if LeBron is playing like royalty, then, you know, they have a chance. I wouldn't say king. When he's playing like royalty, they have a, a chance of closing this out. But they have to come ready to play. Chicago, I do agree with Isaiah. With, with Pau Gasol out, with Derrick Rose struggling with injury, with them never really getting into a rhythm out there. It was a two-point game with 48 seconds left. They get that it's rebound on that amazing. last possession. Yeah, yeah. It may be a different outcome. So they got to take care of business. If not, then a, a lot like the Houston uh, Clipper game where now they mm -hmm. went home. It's a different ball game. They went at home. They're feeling good about themselves. You don't want to come back to have to play game seven uh, in Cleveland. And so Cleveland's going to go there, and, 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 and Mr. James is going to bring his A game, and uh, it, it, should, it should be a good one. This is also the best shooting night the Cavaliers have had this postseason so far. Nearly 51%. Can they replicate that on the road in Game 6? We'll find out on Thursday. More inside coming. Steph rediscovered his stroke in Game 4 to help the Dubs tie up Memphis. We'll look ahead to Game 5 when we come back. Got a pair of Game 5s coming your way Wednesday night starting at 8 Eastern. Both number one seeds needed road wins to tie up their second round series at 2. Golden State Steve Kerr's simple message for his team, keep it up. <laughs> I want them to uh, be satisfied with the effort. I want them to be hungry to improve. And I want them to understand that... Uh, Nothing's happened yet. Steph is a little quiet offensively early on, but then he got his shot going. What did you think when you finally began to see those balls fall for him? Uh, it was only a matter of time. Uh, you know, he's the reason he's MVP and um, one of the best shooters of all time. And um, just his pace of play tonight was something special. No, I never, I never get down. You get frustrated about missing shots and how you play, but you never get down on yourself. Um, we're competitors, and as long as there's another game, you got an opportunity to change it. We didn't expect to get swept. We didn't expect to come and sweep them. So um, we know we're going to have to win there again. And, uh, you know, we got to get our minds right and uh, just try to, you know, find some effort, find that, that uh, you know, intensity that we played with the, the, the past two games. They responded as the number one seed in the West should do. And, uh, you know, it's our time to, to hit back now. We're going to have to score 100 points. I mean, at some point, we are going to have to score 100 points to, to, to win a, a game against them. Uh, you can't just keep you know running your defense out there uh, and leaving them on the field so long. After four games of what has remained a very competitive series despite the injury to John Wall, the Wizards and Hawks are back at square one. With Atlanta having home court advantage and Washington feeling it can get a game here at Phillips Arena, taking the series back to D.C. with a series lead. We won one game without John. We can do it again. It doesn't matter what floor we play on, play on their floor, play on, play on our floor. We have to have guys who are willing to lock in and be focused for 48 minutes and go out there and win whether John's playing or not. Well, we're a resilient team. You know, we, we don't mind being on the road. I mean, I think... You know, our record speaks for itself on the road. So we know our guy, it's an uphill battle now going into their building to try to win again. So, but I think the squad is up to the challenge. How acclimated or comfortable have you become with your new role, maybe as the leader of this team at this point in time? I'm getting more comfortable. You know, it's kind of, I can't make the passes John make yet. So I got a, I got a lot to work on this summer, but it's, uh, it's, it's been, it's been good and bad. You know, it's just a learning experience. I have to grow up. I can't make any excuses. I have to lead the team as best as I can. You know, with John now, we look at him uh, to be our, our our leading scorer, a guy we're going to get the ball to, get a lot of opportunities, and he's doing a great job being responsible for picking his shots and uh, making extra passes, getting assists for us. So uh, he's, he's looking great out there. Can't ask anything more, Brad. Wall's return from a broken left hand may be sooner rather than later. He returned to the practice court on Tuesday in Washington as the Wizards went through a walkthrough. And even though he only shot the ball with his right hand, Randy Whitman said that his recovery is continuing apace. He will meet with team physicians and hand specialist Dr. Thomas Graham before a determination for his status for Game 5 will be made. In Atlanta, I'm David Aldridge. Thank you, DA. Those Game 5s coming tomorrow night. Do you want me to give you that number again? The
2 2 Which series one? game five winner no, wins how much? No number. Do you remember the number? No analytics. If you let that get in your mind, that's what Shaq was saying. That's 80, plyometrics. 82% <laughs> of the time they go on to win the series. That's the number. That's John Wall looking for that Pacquiao shot. Oh, low oh. blow. Love inside the NBA. I know you do, or you wouldn't be here. And make sure you're following NBA on TNT on all the uh, social media outlets. Follow us as well along the way. An updated auto trader drive to the finals standings. Shaq's winning? Oh my God. Wow. Well, I, yeah, I, I gotta talk to Chico about that. Well, you know Shaq got that PhD, so he, he yeah. might be the smartest he, one up there. He so. bought it. You know how to pick. He bought that PhD. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Shaq earned that one. 17 points. Don't let him come between us, Shaq. <laughs> <laughs> I got your back, Shaq. News today, the Pelicans fired head coach Monty Williams after five seasons on the job. Williams led the Pels to the postseason despite a rash of injuries, but New Orleans was swept by the Warriors. As you'd expect, Monty had the proper perspective on the news. My family is indebted to the opportunity we've had here. We came here five years ago, and um, we've been so blessed to do what we do. Um, um, I wanted to bring a championship here to this city. I hope that the things that I have done and our coaching staff and, and players have done will give our team um, for the future something to hold on to. And I just want the fans to know that um, thankful for what they've done for me. I'm so uh, indebted to them. And I, I don't have any any bitterness in my heart, man. I'm a bit hurt, a bit scuffed up. Class reaction from a uh, classy guy, Monty Williams, who uh, mentioned the injuries. Davis Holiday, Eric Gordon, Ryan Anderson missed 98 games over the course of the season, still helped the Pelicans win that eighth spot in the Western Conference with 45 wins, their first playoff spot since 2011. GM Del Demps tried to explain how the decision to let Williams came about. This is an organizational decision in which we decided a coaching change is best for the long-term success of the Pelicans. This is a very difficult decision, but I support it. You said you support the decision. Did you make the decision? This was an organizational decision that was made by ownership and uh, management. Were you the person to notify Monty or Mickey or were you on the meeting? Uh, Mickey talked to Monty. Were you, were you I was not there. I was not there. Did you all talk to Anthony yet about this and gauge his feelings towards it? We, I had a conversation with him after the decision was made. How was it? <laughs> you know, I'll say I, I talked to him, and you know, I think that's you know that'll stay between us. But I did talk to him about after the decision was made, and I talked to a number of players. Is it fair to say you are not concerned this decision will make a contract extension with AD more challenging? You know, I'm not allowed to talk about contract extensions. You know, that's just for, you know, uh, NBA, CBA rules. You know, you're not allowed to talk about those. What about it just in general? This <laughs> Let's take the word contract out of it. I mean, is it fair to say you're not concerned that Anthony's will feel alienated? I did. I don't like to speak for people. You know, I, I have to speak for, you know, myself. Not sure how much was really cleared up there uh, by uh, Dell Demps trying to, well, sort of trying to answer some of the questions along the way. D generally speaking, what did you make of the job that uh, Monty Williams did in New Orleans? Well, I thought he did a good job. I mean, I think that the key thing was the injuries. The injuries this year, I think there was a, an ultimatum made that he had to make the playoffs this year. And with all the injuries, I think Anthony Davis was out 20 games, Tyreek Evans, Drew Holiday, Eric Gordon. Uh, hard to build any kind of continuity. Uh, but he still got that team in, had a big win against San Antonio to actually make the playoffs. Uh, they got swept by Golden State. But, you know, in, in full disclosure, Monty's a great friend of mine. And I know when I went through some personal things in Orlando, some, some rough times, he was one of my teammates and friends who was there for me. So, um, you know, I, I know how hard he worked and how classy he is. He showed that in that interview, uh, I think, on his Front, front of his house. I can't believe Not it. Not sure, yeah. They ambushed him like that. But uh, I, I thought he did a good job. Uh, I'm sad to see him go. But, you know, it, it seems like there's a, a full cell sort of change gonna, going on in that organization. And uh, I wonder if, if Demps will be in the picture 
you know, moving forward as well. Good question. As an opposing player, what, what did you learn to expect from a Monty Williams team? Well, I mean, we've only, I've only talked to Monty a couple times in passing. Really good guy, though. Um, you know, loves the game. But his guys always played hard every night. He motivated those young guys to play hard every night. And to have 45 wins uh, in a tough conference, in a tough year, and actually make the playoffs and then lose your job, I mean, you know, we always talk about in the NBA how it's about winning. And if you look on paper and everything that they did throughout the season with what they had, with all the injuries, through all that, they make the playoffs with that young group of guys. They get experience. And, you know, he, he gets fired. It was the same kind of thing with Mark Jackson. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, things happen. You don't understand. You think it's about winning. But, I mean, I guess that's the business side of it. But, you know, in, in my opinion, if a guy is coaching well and, um, you know, the proof is, is in the results, I, I think they should have jobs and they should keep their jobs. Not only Mark and Monty, but George Carl and Lionel Hollins over the last Absolutely. few years. You know how tough this business is. Now there are three uh, – three jobs open in the NBA, Orlando and Denver being the other two. Those two don't have Anthony Davis on the roster. This is a pretty good one. Yeah, it, you know, and, and let me let me follow up on, I think there's a very troubling thing that's going on in, in the NBA in, in our association with the coaches in terms of criteria. I mean, how do you, how do you hold on to your jobs? You know, what, what's the criteria for Hiring a coach, firing a coach, moving on, making the decision. I mean, how do the coaches know when they're doing a good job, when they're doing a bad job? Some coaches, you know, some, some organizations, the, the coach wins 25 games, 30 games, and the coach is doing a great job. And then you have some coaches who make the playoffs, a coach of the year, win the division, and they get fired. So what's the criteria and how are we evaluating and judging our coaches in this league. And I think the Coaches Association needs to come together and, and maybe put out some type of criteria in terms of so fans will understand what, what's going on and how do we evaluate coaches nowadays. Uh, Doc Rivers' job is secure for the moment, regarded as one of the better coaches in the league. His team loses tonight in Houston. They'll have a chance to wrap up that series Thursday night back in L.A. and in the uh, the aftermath of the Rockets 124 103 win tonight. Doc and James Harden both took to the podium and spoke about it. They just played harder. They were more focused. Um, they played like um, they were the desperate team. We didn't play very desperate tonight. Um, you know, so give them credit. I thought they took us out of all our stuff offensively. I thought they bumped us. They pushed us. Um, so, you know, I was disappointed in, in how we played. That's, that's always on the coach, you know. I really believe that. I got to figure out a way. Um, we didn't play with the urgency that we've played through uh, the playoffs. So that was disappointing to see. James, I know you weren't feeling very well today. Can you talk about how you're feeling and how you were able to play through it and have such a good game? Mark, uh, we won, so that's all that matters. Do you think a win like this can give you all momentum going into the next game? Yes, and it will, you know. Like I said, we found our swagger, and so um, you know we 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 competed uh, very hard tonight. You know, for four quarters, I think we still you know gave up too, too many points uh, from the second through the fourth quarter. Um, you know, but other than that, you know, we did a pretty good job. Good enough to see a game six on Thursday night. James Harden after his first career postseason triple double inside the NBA returns after this. It's time for EJ's Nino Satellite. Presented by NBA.com. Matt. Yes. That's, that's not you. It's not me. Well, it's presented by NBA.com, so it gets the formal name EJ's ah, Nito Satellite. Oh, the, the, the least they could do is give, you, put your name on something. You they've done get, that. I they think can't you get an hard. animation. I've had an animation with the song and everything. They had a little song, but they, they came it was put, a jingle. Uh, they can't put it up? They have. They've done it before. Well, where is it? I, I mean, you're here, you right well, here tonight. I can't, I can't make that happen from here. Dude, you're right here tonight. Dude. They can't put it up? Come on, Jeremy. Dude, they something they up, Jeremy. can't give you a little jingle? It's all right. No, apparently they can't. <laughs> uh, you know what one of my pet peeves is? Uh, the misuse of the word literally. People say literally all the time when the, when the thing they're talking about is not really true, which means it's not literally true. 
But when I say that Chris Bosch uh, went to school literally across the street from where we are right now, <laughs> it's true. True. Yeah. There's there's Studio J. There's McCamish Pavilion, where they the Yellow Jackets play basketball. Yeah. Literally across the street. And we can see it literally. out of the parking lot. Literally yeah. right there. Great time. Memories for you. Absolutely. I uh, passed by my old dorm today. <laughs> See? That's how, that's how close we are. Yeah. That's pretty great. cool. Good time. So Did we you thought, knock on the door? No. <laughs> we thought it, was, it would be cool since it's sort of like old home night here for you. If, if you might want to give a shot to the old fight song. I don't The Georgia Tech fight song. Do it's you know the Georgia Tech? I, I do. Uh, you know, I'm Wait, wait. I think I hear it now. He's only there for one year. I'm a hell of an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I didn't want to sing it. You know the music? <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, I, know, I know the music, yeah. yeah. It's a great song. It's just, um, you know, if you're a very smart and intelligent kind of uh, student, it, you understand it if you went to Tech. But if you didn't, you don't understand it. Shouts out to Georgia Tech. Men in basketball. Well, okay. Oh, there he, told, he told us. <laughs> <laughs> I think somewhere in there he recited a couple of the lyrics along the way. I yeah. did, that's right. Yeah. Grant, how about you? No, I don't know mine. Um, he knows. Raise the rafters, get another championship. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm play songs. Those are the worst lyrics ever. I, I'm not a singer, and I, I, I'm more about the melody than the lyrics. Oh, I listen to the melody. Yeah, See? Still... I, I think you know. I feel like I've heard you sing yours. Indiana. There we go. Oh, Indiana. Oh, Indiana. <laughs> we are for you. We will fight for the cream and crimson. How you gonna have That's, that's a good, good school song. Da, 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 I wish da, 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 da. Like that. Are you? Nice. <laughs> Nicely done. How you gonna it was all right. Who? 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 Who's yours? Me not knowing my fight song. Oh, you're gonna hear from Thanks, people. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna hear. From <laughs> oh man! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, there you go. how'd you find that picture? Oh man! Zeke will be all over it. Yeah. We're gonna win a chicken fun. dinner. <laughs> Thanks Absolutely. for being with us. Thanks a lot for having me. Continued good luck everybody. with the rehab. We look forward to seeing you next season. Chris Bosh, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you. Guys. There you have it. Inside the NBA. EJ, Kenny, Shaq, and Chuck back tomorrow night for another doubleheader. Say hi to my kids, Trent, Jack, Dylan. Love you. Done. Adrian, my babe, love you. Thanks for being there. We'll see you, everybody.